Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 80 of the Showbound Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Raskin, here as always with Ethan Cardwell. Cardsy, how's it going, bud? Good, bro. Doing well. Just back back to the uh, the weekly grind, you know, uh, skated today and went to the gym and kind of get back into a routine after uh, a nice weekend of enjoying Boots and Hearts. But man, let me tell you, it was so hot there. Like it oh, was like... Yeah. And mind you, I, I only went for Friday for like a little bit during the night. And then I went for like most of the day Saturday, but like taking the fact that people go there from Wednesday night until Monday morning, it's like, wow. Like, I don't, it's like, they were saying it was like 42 degrees with the humidity and stuff. And then you're surrounded by a bunch of people and you're trying to sleep in these tents. Like I give those people a shout out. They're absolute warriors for being able to do that. Like you would never be able to do that. eh? No, man. And, and, you know, obviously people are drinking on top of that with the heat. I I wonder how many people got just dehydrated to a really bad point too, because it it just happened to be the hottest weekend ever. There was a heat warning the whole time. And I don't know, man, I I couldn't do it. Like even two days of that is really hard. I, I was walking around outside complaining about the heat, let alone like being surrounded by tons of people sweating, drinking, going crazy. And I, I, I stayed inside in the air conditioning. So, but, but tell us more about boots. It was fun though, man. Like, so obviously I want to talk quickly a bit about the barn burner as well that I played in. So I was going to ask you about that. Let's hear it. Yeah. The the charity hockey game. It was a lot of fun. It was great to see the uh, sad lawn arena. It was packed, dude. Like it was like fully sold out. And it was like, there was a thunderstorm, like hurricane warning that night. So really cool to see all the fans come out. Um, Shout out to my little billet brother. It was his birthday. So that was pretty funny to see him there and be able to like hang out with him, throw him a puck and stuff like that. But the game itself was, it was funny, man. Like, so there was some players from the community, there was some prospects and then obviously there's some unbelievable NHL players and some past players. So you had a big mixture of people there. So it's kind of like everyone in the first few shifts, you're trying to like feel out like, okay, like how hard am I going here? Like, <laughs> what, what can I do? What can I not do? So like, I ended up, I got a goal in the early going and then I'm like, okay, like, I'm just going to pass now. Like, I don't want to be that guy who everyone's like, oh man, chill out, chill out. So the, the game, a lot of fun. We ended up tying um, a lot of sick moves, a lot of nice plays. So I think the, uh, the crowd really enjoyed the show and that's obviously what we were there to kind of do. And yeah, and then from there, boots and hearts. And well, even I, wait, I, I want to cut you off before you even go into that. What about like you were on John Tavares's team? Um, what what was it like being with him and in the locker room with him and stuff like that? Like you can just tell, like he's he's a pro, right? Like he uh, he just carries himself with that manner, and they all do. Like even at charity games, like get a quick little stretch in before or something like that. Just make sure your body's right, and then and then when they're out there, man, like just. Like Tavares himself, his hands, oh, like ridiculous hands. Obviously, you have guys like Sags out there, um, Byfield, and the list goes on. We've had a bunch of them on the pod already, but no, it was it was incredible to kind of see a guy like Tavares and a guy like Sagan, two of the most, like highest paid players in the NHL right now, like up close. Like obviously, I've skated with Sagan before, but to see Tavares as well, like he gets knocked a lot about his skating, but his skating's not that bad but you can see why he makes up for it. His hockey IQ is off the charts. Just some of the plays he makes even out there is like, wow, man. Like you can tell why he's making what he is. Yeah. That's so sick, man. I saw the picture of him signing autographs. Like there was tons of people with Leafs jerseys and he was just like signing autographs through the tunnel and stuff. But, but that's really cool. Uh, I wish I could have gone to that game, man, but yeah, let's, let's hear about boots. Oh, like I didn't even go for that long, man. Cause like I, when I was younger, uh, when I was like 17, I think I went for like the whole time, like not the whole time, but like Thursday until like Sunday morning or something. But this time I'm like, you know what? I'll just, you know, take care of my body a little bit. Try not to, because you don't want to be eating that like crappy food all the time either. Right. So it's hard to kind of find a good balance when you're at boots and hearts. So I think I did a pretty good job like Friday, still into the gym and stuff and then eat properly. And then kind of had my dinner before boots and hearts so i wasn't eating pizza and poutine for dinner but uh no it was good friday night jake owen and uh dustin lynch and they put on a show um i got amazing weather while i was there and then saturday all day i got to spend some quality time with all the boys um enjoy florida georgia line they were absolutely incredible so 
it was uh, it was a good weekend all around. Saw a lot of familiar faces, a lot of showbound alum running around there. So uh, and and a bunch of showbound fans as well, getting a lot of shout outs, a lot of people saying hi to you. So obviously, uh, always a pleasure when uh, when some of the fans reach out. Yeah, I know it sounds like a good time, and uh, people were asking me why and go and stuff, but I don't know. I'm not a huge country guy, right? And maybe, maybe next year I'd go, but I would do what you do, like go for a day, and then I'm, pr- I probably wouldn't camp there. I'd, I'd go oh, stay yeah, somewhere. Oh no way, Barry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe if you have like an RV or something, camp. But like, I think like yeah, go for a day, go for a day and a half. Like it's perfect. You enjoy yourself, but you don't feel like brutal your body and stuff. So it's a good balance of both. You get the best of both worlds that way and uh, still get to enjoy the, uh, the concerts and they were unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, so tomorrow we're recording this right now, Monday, tomorrow's Tuesday. I'm going to the, the national bank open the tennis tournament, it, formerly the Rogers cup. Um, yeah. So I'm checking that out and uh, the women are playing in Toronto. The men are in Montreal. So I'm going to see the women. We got Bianca Andreescu, who I went to high school with, who's like, top Canadian top in the world Serena Williams is playing she won today I saw so gonna see some good some good tennis like you you know and the listeners I'm a, I'm a tennis guy I like tennis um yeah so I'm I'm pumped I, I go every year to this thing and uh it should be really fun so that's that's what I got going on tomorrow um I remember I always, you saying that you like love tennis and like because you always you like follow it like 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 religiously kind of right like keep an eye on it and see how they're all doing that'll be incredible though to see like such high-end women athletes like performing at their best so that'll be a hell of a time yeah no it's always fun man and the way they have tennis tournaments i've never been to a golf tournament i imagine it's probably similar but there's multiple well no it, it wouldn't be similar but for tennis there's multiple courts going on at once so you got like center court the big one and then you got all these like side courts and there's a, like a concourse, I guess you could say going on where there's tons of things to do as a fan. So you can go and you can play um, table tennis or you can play like they have all these other things like pictures, how hard you can serve. Um, you can watch the practices that there's like a lot of things to do. Then there's the, there's shopping, there's all sorts of stuff. It, it's a really cool setup they have going on. So it's fun. It's not just sitting and watching a, a game. You can walk around the grounds and, and pop in wherever you want. But anyway, uh, I want to talk a bit of hockey stuff. Firstly, we can introduce our guest for this week. We got Curtis Gabriel, who briefly last season played on the Leafs, where many Toronto fans might remember him fighting everyone in the preseason, and then spent some time last year between uh, the Chicago Blackhawks and the Rockford Ice Hogs. And um, he does a lot in the community. And we get to talk about some of his ventures going on and, and the career he's having so far. So interesting interview coming up with a, a guy who's honestly a great guy, local guy too, from a new market here, Ontario. So cool one coming up. NHL wise, we talked about it last episode with the uh, Calgary, Florida trade and Jonathan Huberto signed a big eight year, $10.5 million average annual value contract. Um, what are your thoughts on that signing? Obviously, it's important to lock them up. Well, yeah, you kind of look at it in the sense that we we were saying that they're pretty comparable players in, in terms of putting up numbers and stuff. Obviously, Kachuk adds that physical aspect to the game, but you literally, he just, they basically now they've swapped players for very similar contracts, swapped those players, and now they got that package that's coming along with Huberto, and there's a lot of talks about weaker signing as well. So, it's looking very good. And that, that was an amazing signing by the Calgary Flames. And then uh, another one, they just locked down Mangiapane for another few years. And a guy I got to know a little bit this weekend and a great dude. Yeah. Another uh, former Cole. He was playing in the barn burner, right? Yeah. He's playing in the barn burner. And then he was there as well on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Calgary's in good shape, man. You, they lost two massive pieces, but they picked up two big ones, some prospects, like they're, they're doing fine. And as far as their, their development over the next couple of years, the way they're looking, but the thing with Huberto, and I know people sign these, like all sorts of contracts like this, but so he's, he's 29 years old now, eight year contract. He'll be 37 at 37. He'll still be making 10.5 a year. Now at that point, I mean, that's so far down the road that you don't even bother because to lock him up now is worth it. But that's a big contract for what you assume his production will be eight years from now. Right. So um, 
I don't know. It'll be, uh, it'll be interesting, but I mean, you have to lock him up. You, you got to keep him happy or else he's going to want to want to leave there, you know? Yeah. But typically, you know, like, I don't know how the contract breakdown went. It, it'll probably be a lot of signing bonus and it'll be a front end contract, giving the most money at the beginning of that contract. And then what they typically do is let it fade out at the end, lower salary. So it's really not burning much of the salary each year. And if you still have an amazing player and who knows, right? Like how guys progress or, decline at an older age but um yeah it's de- it's definitely a real good signing for the flames yeah and, and you know like it i mean you never know but it's a good assumption that he'll still be playing at a high level at that point yeah. um but uh yeah but his contract is throughout the whole time 10.5 annually it doesn't change um now i i also wanted to say kind of before we send it to the interview we haven't been doing like bachelor bachelorette segment and stuff but i've still been watching the bachelorette um <laughs> how is it it's good. I wanted to tell you because going back, we talked about it a while ago, but there's two bachelorettes this season, right? Remember when I said that? Yeah. I find that absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. But it's made the show really good. There's, there's a lot more drama. Um, it's, it's really entertaining because like the, the two bachelorettes are almost competing against each other in a way now, because like there's, there's guys who they have to pick their sides. You don't know, uh, who they want to go for and then they're making them pick and it's like now they want to switch and stuff so it's a it's a good one I like this this method that they're doing and I hope they kind of keep it going forward well I find that absolutely right but is there an episode is it on Mondays or Tuesdays Mondays okay I'm gonna watch it tonight actually because I don't think the Canada game's on TV so but I actually on another note because we have world juniors coming up um, I talked to JT today Jack Thompson uh, good friend of the pod who everybody knows quite well now after his few episodes on here but uh he said team canada is looking good and uh they're ready to go they have a preseason game against uh sweden tonight and he he was saying like uh it feels so weird in the middle of summer playing in the world juniors but it's like obviously a once in a lifetime opportunity and uh he said uh it's been great so far so he's enjoying it and he's doing really well. And he said all the uh, former guests of the pod as well are uh, having a good time and gearing up uh, for a big one. Yeah. I- I'm excited to watch the-, the only thing and tell me if you agree or disagree, but I, I can't get myself as into it as before. And I don't know, obviously I hope I'm going to watch it and I hope Canada wins, but I don't know if I'll care as much. Like, is that fair to say? Yeah. I think for every country, like, I think it's an annual tradition that at Christmas time, the world juniors are on and for all countries around the world, like you see when it's in Europe, we're up at night watching it. And when it's here, they're up at night watching it. So I do think it'll be a little bit different. Um, You could either like sometimes like, and it's not holidays, right? Everybody's on holidays when uh, it's going on before. So yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a little odd to have it in the summer. Yeah. But Regardless, I'm just excited to watch some good hockey again, and it'll get me in the mood for the uh, for the camps that are coming up pretty soon now, man. So, um, I guess, are you ready to go? The season, the season's already right around the corner, dude. I was just talking about like this with all the guys at the skate today, like, cause we're just sitting there, and it's like, man, like we gotta go in like a month here, like less than a month we're going, and like it's crazy to think, but like if you look back on it, I've been doing so much this summer that time flies and my I go into my trainer the other day and he's like yeah you've just completed your like 48th session here or something in the summer and I'm like oh my god like it doesn't feel like that it felt like I just lost out of the playoffs yesterday and I'm still like getting settled at home it's so weird to think that the new hockey season's upon us but me and you as big hockey guys obviously really excited for it and i know you're gonna have a lot on your plate this year so when do you start you got to be starting sooner than all of us yeah i mean i i start really i mean i've never i've never stopped at least my working because all summer is recruiting so i've just been on that but i mean we got camps kicking off at the end of august and captain skates at brock and ice dogs camp and um you know preseason for ohl and u sports starts early september so really we're we're a month away we got the the big brock golf tournament coming up at, at the end of august which i'm pumped about because my game's been getting better so i'm ready to, yeah. to smoke thanks. some people thanks for the invite buddy <laughs> well i invited you last year and your camp sorry i just assumed your camp would 
would be going. Well, what's the date? August 31st. Can you make it? I don't know. I'll see. Is Marty but, going? I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I, I, I've been slacking on it. I've been so focused on getting it going that I I, I, <laughs> I remember. But Rochi, I don't know if you, you saw we posted a little Rochi clip on the Brock Men's Hockey social media. Yeah. <laughs> so Wait, maybe, hey, maybe you come in with him. Here's the deal. I say you call Marty because that will be when camp's going on and I'm going, I'm going to Barry camp obviously first. Um, so I see you call Marty and you say, well, if you're going, then cards gets the day off as well. And he gets to come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So maybe I'll have to ask Marty then. And, uh, yeah, but we'll figure it out anyway. It's exciting, man. I'm, I'm pumped to get it going. A chance for three rings this year, not a big deal. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, we'll, we'll send it over to Curtis Gabriel. Now we got a great interview. So here it is. All righty. We're pleased to be joined now by Curtis Gabriel. Gabriel, how's it going, bud? It's going well, fellas. I just started uh, the Matt Nichols gym for uh month of August and it was a hell of an experience today. So I'm having a great day, a little hectic, but it's been good. How about yourselves? Yeah, we're, we're all good. I, I saw that actually on your Insta story today, you were talking about it there at the pond and uh, <laughs> must, must be a good one. I, I just have to say for, for the audio uh, listeners who, who don't see this, but but you jump on the Zoom with the name Michaela Demater, who I, I think a lot of our listeners probably know who that is, but your, um, your girlfriend. And uh, it just gave me a chuckle. So uh, I just wanted to say that for a little for reference. So if I'm laughing, that's that's what it is. But um, how, how's your offseason going so far? You mentioned the gym, but how's it going overall? Uh, it's going pretty good, man. Um, as you get older, you start to, I don't know. When you're younger, you hear everybody tell you experience matters and you're like, ah, oh, that's stupid. Like, what does it matter? That doesn't mean anything. I'm going to figure all this out for myself. But you really start to kind of grow up and gain experience. So I feel like I'm starting to kind of put everything together and I've always been a bit of a, a late bloomer. So I feel like I keep getting better with age. I'm not a wine drinker, but aging like, like fine wine. And um, I don't know. I just feel like I, I, I understand stuff a lot more. I'm really excited for the future. So a lot of that's been like uh, getting into meditation and uh, spirituality and stuff and it's really kind of freeing me up to uh i don't know experience life more not be as stressed out about hockey i know you guys know about that and uh i think you guys doing this podcast and that's why i wanted to come on especially i think it's amazing that you guys have outlets and kind of uh, different ways to kind of approach things in life so i'm really big on that and uh, it seems like you guys are too yeah definitely and and i mean talking about stress and stuff it might be a stressful topic to bring up but it's free agency. You, you haven't signed a contract for next year yet. Is there anything you can tell us or spill the beans or just like how that's going for you? Yeah, it's been a strange uh, summer. I think a lot of teams, like you can see, there's a lot of team uh, guys still unsigned and a lot of teams that are kind of figuring out their cap situation. I think they thought in the past it was going to go up and then now the the you know revenue was higher. So they think it might go up. It's been a kind of a, a tightrope walk for a lot of them. So just staying patient and and uh, I know that uh, whatever comes my way may not be what I want, may not be what I need, but I, th I think I can still play and I'm excited to, to see what comes. Yeah, obviously looking to set up for a big year and you've made a hell of a name for yourself, especially in the past few years with uh, obviously with the Sharks. And I don't know if you know, so I'm drafted by the Sharks. And so I, I'm really good buddies with all those guys that you lived with um, in San Jose. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But we want to start it back in uh in the ohl and kind of work our way up from there and uh four years in owen sound so you want to just tell us quickly how owen sound was for you yeah um first of all that's awesome cards i can't wait to talk about that that's hilarious um, yeah. i did know your draft i know i know about your career so uh owen sound i was um i don't know i felt like i was never supposed to be there because i was undrafted and i played double a minor midget i didn't know anything about hockey i didn't have a hockey dad it was just my mom and me and uh, I, you know, signed with the new market hurricanes and then the OJHL. And that was like the show for me at the time, like a year before that, I didn't even think I was going to be pursuing hockey at, in any way, shape or form. I thought I was just going to be like, you know, normal kid, go to university somewhere. Uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. So to get to there and get offered a contract after a crazy, like rookie camp and main camp, um, get basically the last slot on the team, just to slide into an incredible OHL lineup, uh, end up winning the OHL championship that year played like half the games. <laughs> it was tough, man, not getting to play. Played like two shifts a game for 40 games and then shut her down from January till the Mem Cup, six months without playing hockey. And I just grinded and worked at my game and it was tough, but uh, that's the dues you got to pay. And then coming back the next year, I actually got invited to 
Phoenix's camp uh, off barely playing the OHL and I made a couple of cuts at main camp and I was like, thought I was all sick. Come back the second year. think I'm going to, you know, rip it up. No nope. fourth line, barely any points get beat up nine out of 10 times. Uh, just get humbled to the core of my being and uh, had to, I was told that I wasn't going to, you know, I didn't have a shoe in spot next year for the team and I had to go come back and earn it. And uh, my mom forked out some cash that she really didn't probably have for Gary Roberts. And I got up to my weight. I am now 215. And I came back and I uh, went to camp. And I remember it was on like the fifth line in camp. And I was like, oh, God, this is not good. So I went to the coach and I was just like, hey, you got to give me a chance. Or I'm like, you, you got to at least give me a chance to prove myself. If you're not going to give me anything, why well, might as well just leave? Put me on the third line with uh, two guy, other guys my age. And we just started to dominate as like a checking third line playing against top lines. I fought everybody, beat up most guys that year, and everything just kind of blossomed from there. I got drafted in the third round. I didn't even know I was still eligible to get drafted. Um, <laughs> freaking nuts. And then to go back and play as an overager was good. But it was a really strict uh, reg regiment there. You know, 10.30 curfew. I know you know about that in the OHL. Like, it was a hard line. There was no messing around. I'm sure some guys did, but I was pretty terrified to lose my spot. So I, I kept it pretty tight and uh, focused on hockey at the rink twice a day and just grinding. Yeah. No, oh, so I, I was going to ask you about kind of all that, but uh, <laughs> you kind of you kind of hit all the bases for us. But I, I want to ask you quickly about obviously you said you didn't play much, but how cool was it to win a championship? Yeah, just to see those guys. Uh, I mean, I just I didn't know anything was going on because like, I was so green. I was just there. I didn't really go out much with the guys, so I felt like I was kind of separated from it. I was such like a new kid to junior hockey. So, but to be at the rink and hear all the stuff, they were having a good time away from the rink when they got to win. When they win, they got to go out and have fun. And when they didn't win, they didn't get to do anything. So uh, it seemed like it formed a pretty tight knit group and uh, they loved each other, played for each other. You had a lot of overagers from coming from different teams. And it was just like a perfect mix of younger and older and talent that was younger and older. And to see that town just light up to win the championship and the whole parade home on the bus, I'm sitting there like, what is going on? Like, I just <laughs> have to be here. Uh, so it was pretty cool to be a part of. I, I did want to mention and shout out my boy, Jared Maidens, who scored the yeah. biggest goal in Owen Sound history, the, the, oh, the Game 7 overtime championship winning goal. So that's pretty nasty, like no bigger moment than that. Um, but yes, NHL draft, you did go third round of the Minnesota Wild. And um, can you just tell us about uh, like leading up to that draft, where it was, and then kind of like, did you go there and the moment you got picked, like all about it? Yeah, for, you know, never going through the OHL draft, I was like, what's going on? Like, am I, do I even need to go down to New Jersey? And my agent was like, yeah, like you're going to go fifth round. And if somebody wants you earlier, third, and I was like, like what? So <laughs> sure, I will go. You better be right. So we went and saw my buddies get picked in the second round, Chris, Chris Begris and Zach Nastasiak. And then I knew that um, Nashville really liked me. I knew that uh, Edmonton really liked me and uh Ed, but minnesota had a pick right before both of them and i he, they were my last interview with craig channel at a tim hortons down the street from my house we talked for like two hours and just shot the breeze about hockey and uh yeah he i heard all i heard was from Owen sound i didn't hear my name called because you know he had rush of emotions and mom's freaking out and everything and then just kind of floated down those steps uh at the draft to kind of get my jersey and start that whole thing it still just felt like a dream because literally two and a half years earlier I thought I was just like going to university to like stuff I don't know I was gonna be like a zookeeper or something I don't know I like animals I didn't know anything about anything so I was just like <laughs> you know, I'm a kid so I was just yeah. happy to be there no oh, that's that's crazy man it, it, you do have quite an awesome story and uh, I'm curious did you get any unique or memorable questions from GMs or scouts during the draft interview process I had an inter interesting draft interview process because I wasn't ranked on anything and being a third year eligible. That was back when not many guys got picked at that like stage. I think that was the year of like a couple more guys than normal. And then now you see guys getting picked wherever. It doesn't really matter when they have a good year, they get picked. So it was the comment I was in Toronto. I didn't get, you know, brought down to that. I was like the sleeper pick that like every team was like getting me to drive down from new market and like go through like a back door to talk to them so that, cause they didn't want anybody else to know they're interested. But then of course my agent does this thing and tells everybody. So I had interviewed with like 22 teams, which blew my mind. Uh, I couldn't believe it, but I, I remember uh, what ones stick out. Edmonton was my last one, and we talked for it was I was their last one out of like 100 kids, and I we talked for way longer than usual. And they're like, "Do you want a job as a scout? Because we'll just hire you right now. You know enough about hockey." That was funny to me. Craig, Craig, That's Craig. almost insulting, though. Like, did you take that badly? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. I, I was just happy to be there. I was just shooting the you know what I thought about hockey, and McTavish was just like, "Frick, I like this kid." So 
I mean, it was, int- I thought I was going to go there in Nashville and I had to be in Minnesota, but um, not really. I don't, I think as an older guy, you know, and not a top round pick or something, I didn't get like the crazy ones to figure out my like psychological analysis and all that. So I just got it pretty straight up. And I was just like, yeah, like, I don't know, man, I'm going to take this as far as I can. I'm just pumped to be here and I love hockey. So I hope you pick me. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. Like, I was just like, sure. <laughs> absolutely whatever it takes to get there right and then and then obviously you do go to minnesota and the draft goes well and everything and you finish out your ohl career and then you find yourself up and down a little bit between minnesota and iowa for a few years there and quickly like you always talk about your mental game improving and freeing yourself up so in the first few years of your pro career how did you find it mentally for yourself yeah to be honest boys i think uh making the OHL with zero expectations. That was what got me there. I didn't put any pressure on myself. I was just happy to be there. As I've been saying, I was present. I was so lost in just competing. And then when you get drafted, everybody, I'd never had that infrastructure growing up of pressure and all these things. And everybody's telling me, Oh, you're, you know, you're a late draft pick. You're going to play right away. You're going to get games your second season. So everything seemed on track. Right. And as soon as it didn't seem on track, I wasn't equipped to handle that. I don't believe. And, um, kind of strange to look back, but that's, that's really what expectations and outcomes in your life. Really. That's what creates suffering. If you have a great expectation of something that's not met, you're going to create a lot of suffering in there. So it caused a lot of stress, uh, after it started to seem like it wasn't on track. So the first couple of years were great, you know, played a good amount. Uh, next year, got some first couple of games, got a couple of fights in my first two games, realized I could hang, and then, uh, you know, fighting all the American League tough guys who I always think are way tougher. And then that third season, when I had expectation going to training camp, I was like, OK, like I got to make it now. And I didn't. And then I get up there <clears throat> in November. and I think we go on the longest winning streak in franchise history. And I'm like, OK, now I made it. I played 13 games, won every game. I fought six times like the people are loving it. Like I'm here now. <laughs> Boom. Get told that I'm not ready. Sent back down. So when that kind of hit, it kind of changed things. And I think. That's when I talk about at 29, where I've learned a lot of stuff. I think I've come full circle and I'm back to being like the 17 year old mindset where I'm just happy to play hockey and whatever happens. Great. And that's, what's going to allow me to kind of go up again. So it's been a, it was a strange little ride there in Minnesota. Yeah. And you talk about kind of ups and downs. So one of the biggest ups probably in your career, how did you find out you were going to play in your first NHL game and how did that game go? Yeah, that was <laughs> John Tochetti. He's this, uh, Jamaican Plains, Boston coach who just loved me. And uh, I love, I, I love uh, that guy. He was awesome to me. He was my coach in the minors at the time. And I think I was like, just stepping in the shower and he's like, somebody yelled, go get gay bone. And you know, his Boston accent. So I put my towel on and just walked in his office, like halfway with my towel on. He's like, you're going to play in the show. And I'm like, what? And I was, <laughs> he's like, he's like, pack your shit, kid. Like, you know, put all my stuff in the car grabbed a suit, ran up there. Um, actually they really eased me in, which I thought was really smart of them. Like, they brought me up the first time. Um, I think, no, he, I think he said that that was the time I was going up, but I wasn't going to play. So the second, that's the second time I got called up where I was for sure going to play. They put me in warm up the first time and sent me back down against Winnipeg. Then they brought me up against, again, against Winnipeg and gotten, a, I got in the lineup. Um, my mom, brother, stepdad and best friend flew in and then another buddy flew in on like a red eye from Saskatchewan just to watch me play Devin Reimerchuk if you know Jared Maidens uh him and his dad came and uh, I just remember sitting in Warmies and I was standing like I just said screw it I'm gonna stand center ice and I look back at the home end and the music was just pumping I had like one family my family on this side my friend on this side and it was just like a cool moment to like be like all right I'm here and then it was back to lock in and I remember I like hammered Mark Stewart my first shift that got like the building going um so it was it was pretty cool and then to go out for dinner afterwards took my family to like the Capitol Grill I'm like I'm not making any money tonight I just not gonna spend it on my family right like the one day you're up there and Nico Koivu came over and talked chatted with me and 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 talked to my family it was really classy yeah that's unbelievable yeah that's awesome so um before moving on to I'm just curious because we already talked a lot about fighting and it's a part of your game but when did it start? Were, were you fighting in minor hockey or was it like when you got to junior, then you realized this is what you got to do to stick or like, how did it start? Yeah. Well, my mom's a teacher. So I was always best behaved guy. If somebody was bullying, I'd be like, Hey, like we can go out back, but like, I really don't want to, I'd rather not have to do that. Let's just stop being an ass. Like I was always sticking up for, that was always my kind of role. I feel like I've always been that guy. So when I, when I didn't get, you know, I was minor midget and I went to play a uh, major midget in Markham. I had a coach tell me, he's like, Hey, I know you're trying out for junior A teams. And this is before I signed with Newmark. And he goes, you're not going to be a goal scorer. So if you want to start playing more physical to see how that is, that's where, that's where you're going to have to do. 
And I remember I told my mom, we were driving home. It was like 12 AM. Cause we were, you know, late major midget practices. You don't get to get ice time. And I'm like, mom, I got to start playing physically. He says, she's like, all right, we'll try it. <laughs> so I started trying it. And I, you know, I'm a more energetic kind of extroverted guy. I like to get after it. I'm intense when, you know, flip the switch. So it kind of worked out well and I started enjoying it and relishing it. And then, uh, going to the OHL realizing, okay, now I'm kind of expected to a little bit. And that's when I said, I kind of got beat up that, that second season I was there when I got to play, I worked with some kind of boxing kind of coach, but then I was like, okay, I can't just be boxing. I went back and I found a guy that was willing to like put on karate outfits and hockey gear and like practice actually like grappling and stuff. And that's kind of when I got better at it. Okay. Very wow. interesting. And uh, well, so moving on to, to where you ended up getting drafted in New Jersey and you go play there. So you, you scored your first NHL goal in a Devils jersey. So can you tell us who it was on and how did you score it? Yeah, it's always a funny question because the first one, I don't know, I didn't, it just wasn't as like good as you think it was. It was against Ottawa. They weren't playing. We weren't very good, but they were bad. And I remember my buddy, good buddy, Brett Cini, He's like, uh, we're going to take a face off and I'm your right winger. And he put me on the left side on the left side of the offensive zone. He's like, Gabriel, I'm going to win this and shoot the damn puck. I was like, okay. He won it right on my stick. I stepped into it, shot it. Anders Nielsen, it was going wide, reached out, tried to catch it and it went down his back and in his net. And I kind of was like, oh, well, nice to get that one out of the way. But the really, the really, what I feel like was my first goal. And what I think about was two nights later against Montreal. And I think they needed to play well because they were trying to make a playoff push and we could spoil it. So we we're all fired up to play Montreal broadcasting Canada. And then I ended up scoring the game winner on Carey Price. And it was a goal where like I earned it, you know, like I went in on the four check. I think I knocked Mete off a puck, got it back to the point, beat him to the net, was able to tip a puck down onto Price and then find the rebound and put it in and then have like a room, room to celebrate, like to really celebrate. And it was, whoa, it's like the best feeling of my goddamn life, man. Like it's unbelievable jump in the glass kind of thing. So yeah, that was probably the best feeling of my life so far. So that and it made it special too, wearing the pride tape on my stick. So that kind of uh, made my career kind of go a different way as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to pull up the video of that. I'm gonna I'm gonna need to watch that one. But that sounds so cool. I got like the chills just listening to that and seeing your emotion out of it too. So, um, but that year in New Jersey, there you you kind of split it most of your time, like up and down. You got a lot of NHL games, and so what's your mindset after that? Like maybe that summer because you know, like you're right there and you got <laughs> you got the look. So. How do, how do you feel? I can tell you about that. That season, it wasn't up and down, actually. So it, I went into camp. I thought I did my job. I got cut on behind the glass with the camera on my damn face telling me I'm cut. I'm pissed off. That wasn't fun. I go down to the minors, and I'm like, okay, we actually look like we have a decent team down here. I got Kevin Rooney as my center and Bastion as my right winger, now two NHLers. So I, I knew they were good. First two games, I got like two apples. I think we won one game, lost the other one, but we were playing good minutes, feeling good. And boom, scratched, right? And that was the first time I kind of hit me. I wasn't a prospect for the team that drafted me anymore. So that was a little bit of a wake-up call, you know, like, oh, God. Um, so that was that was a different kind of feeling. Um, lost a lot of confidence, went down the drain confidence-wise. Uh, was in and out of the lineup there. Um, and then I kind of – I remember David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me, came out, and I started crushing that book. I ended up listening to it like six times in the next, like, month, and I started practicing, like, a game, like, full-on. I was talking to Mikey McLeod the other day. I ran him in practice, fought Eric Griba. I was just playing a practice like a legitimate game because if I'm not going to play, I'm going to get it out somewhere. Uh, got back in the lineup, started to play a bit better, and then uh, New Jersey was having a little bit – they wanted some toughness, and I ended up going up there. I think I ended up going there because they wanted to get some – minor kids down and uh, there's this eligibility thing if you don't aren't down by the all-star break you can't go about back up and down so I think they kind of just used me as I was always working hard bring them up for some money uh I stayed over the Christmas break I skated extra to make sure I was in shape and then I came back and I went on a run where I played really well and ended up playing the rest of the year in the NHL so it's crazy how things can turn around when you start like doing things the right way you know what I mean so that, that was a pretty cool thing for me I thought you know what 22 games, a bunch of penalty minutes, you know, four points isn't bad. I was, you know, we weren't the best team, but I thought I had a chance to come back and maybe get a good two way, maybe sniff a one way, but not even a call. Wow. And then obviously that leads us to San Jose and you got a lot of hype in San Jose, like uh, from all the media outlets when you were there and kind of when you were up with the Sharks, you were putting on a show and you're fighting every heavy that you could find in the league. It seemed like there for a period of time. So quickly, do you want to talk about, uh, both the Sharks and playing for the CUDA. And yeah. I know you guys had a crazy year with the CUDA that year too. So you want to talk about that as well? 
Yeah, I mean, and, but after New Jersey, I went to Philly and I got buried in the minors all season after playing the show. And that, let me tell you, that was a tough pill. That was a tough pill. Uh, I forgot about that. Rask, you need to put that in the outline so I'm not looking like an idiot. That's all me. That's all yeah. me. No, but I, I just share because it's in, like, it's just the arc of like the ups and downs, right? Like, yeah. I just thought I was sniffing a good chance to be back in the show and then I don't even get a call. And then I go to Philly where the, Chuck Fletcher originally drafted me and now I'm there and I got hurt in camp, got cut on behind the glass again two years in a row, uh, <laughs> went down and then they signed Chris Stewart out of like, you know, the EIHL and I got put down there and I didn't probably, I don't know, it's just a strange year. So then I go to San Jose and I'm like, all right, enough's enough. That's why you saw all that stuff up there. The second I get up there, I'm doing whatever it takes to stay there, like whatever it takes. So I think I went up against, I uh, got put in, I was on the taxi squad. It's tough to stay in shape. And that was the first time they've ever had a taxi squad. So it was a little interesting. I go in the lineup, I'm barking at Reeves, but I just didn't have like the gas to make an impact. So I'm like, you know what? After that game, I said, send me down. Let me play some games for the CUDA and let me like get in shape a bit here because the taxi squad's brutal. I went down there and I got to play like a ton. I had like three points in two games, fought one of the toughest guys down there, kind of got my swagger back and came back up and went on a little run there where I was just like, I don't give a crap. Like I'm not leaving. You can't take me out of the lineup. And I gave it as best I could. And it was a pretty cool experience and a strange year with COVID, you know, living in California, but you can't do anything because everything's closed. It was weird, dude. Yeah. And then you want to talk a little bit, were you there in the, when you guys were in, what was it called with the CUDA? Um, when they oh, were no, I wasn't Arizona. there for that. I wasn't you there, weren't for there for that. No. Okay. Thank God. They got stuck in a freaking hotel with no food and an ice storm in Arizona or something yeah. or, or something. It was nuts. Yeah, I, I don't know where it was, but also do you want to talk about living with who? So who was it? You were with Galley, Zach Gallant, uh, Brandon Coe, Mercs and there was one more, right? Uh, no, I think that we'd have some guys come crash here and there. Uh, one of our, uh, like, a, like a guy that would come up and down between the coast and there, a tough guy, he would crash on the couch. So we had like, <laughs> it was like a typical like minor league thing that you hear about, right? It was me, the, the vet with all the rookies. I had the first overall pick in the OHL draft. Mercs had the third overall in Co. and Gallant was the fifth. So I was joking that like, you know, <laughs> the guy who wasn't drafted the O was living with all the superstars and I would always chirp him about it and stuff um that was really fun it's so expensive to live there so we had to get a townhouse there's no you can't live on your own you want to get a, you want to live on your own have a full kitchen you're paying at least three grand so we we're like no we got a six grand townhouse and split it between three of us so at least it was only two each and then we let Cole just crash in the extra bedroom because he wasn't signed yet because he was that like tweener between the ohl and pro right yeah. uh, so that was that was a lot of fun you know you know mercs you know these guys mercs is just a goofball uh he was just chilling all the time i think i think night one Galley made him food and the deal was Merck's had to clean it up. And then Merck's cleaned it up once. He's like, yeah, I'm never doing that again. And then he just ordered food the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah. I, I heard about that, man. Like Merck's was like, yeah, man, like I might've spent like more than I made with the CUDA on skip the dishes. Like, and so, and they said you were pretty good about it. Like you were making food and stuff, but like, they were like, there's no way. Like they were like, Gaber knows how to like do it properly. Like a pro and, and Merck's is way better now that he has like, He's been there for a few years, but that was so funny when I heard that. He's like, yeah, skip the dishes. <laughs> and he just loved it. He would just boss into that couch and eat some good food and take a nap. And I'd be in the kitchen just buzzing, doing whatever I got to do. And then I'd be like, Gaber, make me some food. I'm like, no, I'm not enabling you. I'm not making you food. There's no chance. I'm eating what I need to eat. If you want to come over here and chat and make it with me, you can make it with me. But I ain't making you food. I'm not your mom. I said, I've been cooking my damn food since I was 16 by myself, bro. I'm, I'm not new to this. Like, this is my food, my kitchen. Get out of here yeah well we we got to get Mercs on soon actually and, and just kind of hear about that guy because he's an interesting dude as well so but i heard so much good stories about uh about you guys at that house and it sounded like a a lot of fun but after that obviously you go to the leafs hometown kid how did that go down and how excited were you when you signed with the leafs yeah i was pretty excited man obviously um never lived downtown. So me and my girlfriend got a partner down here. That's where we are still right now. So that was cool. Living like I'm two kilometers from the big rink, uh, started training right away at the MasterCard center, which is just like a factory. Like so many people are working there and so much access to whatever you need was pretty impressive. Haley Wickenizer is like the player development person. She's wheeling around, helping everybody out. It was really cool. Um, you know, signed my first one way. And I don't know if that's the reason, but those guys, just the big guys there that like a lot of them stay in Toronto and train. So JT, uh, Tavares just, you know, messaged me and invited me up to the cottage with all them made me feel so included. Uh, 
I'll never forget that trip, man. I actually, that was some freaking blast up there on uh, Lake Rosso in Muskoka. That was crazy. I've never been up there like that. So that was out of control. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I thought I did well at camp. I gave it everything I had. I tried to get fired up, I tried to fight as much as I could and play physical. Um, really proud of how I did. And then, um, you know, last cut or second last cut or whatever it was to go down to the Marlies. And uh, it was pretty cool just even to play preseason games, uh, to walk to the, just to walk to a game in the preseason and, you know, wearing your suit and you're walking down the street from you're from here and you're going to play. It was a pretty cool experience. Yeah, exactly. And I, yeah, I was just going to ask, like, that was my next question. Like how cool was it being around those guys? And you answered it to a T there, but then you, you do go to Chicago and were you, were you excited for a fresh start there or what was the, uh, what was the deal there? Yeah, I just, you know, they picked up Clifford. So I just felt like, you know, there wasn't as much room for, for me here. And I accommodated that. So I really appreciate that. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. It, uh, I got a couple games in Chicago where there's a lot of COVID shutdowns. I got COVID. It was over the Christmas, there's the Christmas break. And then another COVID shutdown. It kind of wasn't the best uh, situation for a new person coming in, I guess, a new player. But uh, I gave it everything I had. And then was down to Rockford and probably had, I was really lucky this year, even the Marlies, uh, but the Rockford Ice Hogs, I was just talking to Malcolm Subban today who actually left that team right before I came in and he's still in our group chat. That's how good of this group of guys is in Rockford. Like, I don't think we're ever going to delete this group chat because these guys are just unbelievable. Like it was such a cohesive unit. And I think that's what made it so fun playing in Rockford. And uh, we got into the second round of the playoffs, which I hadn't played playoff hockey since I got into the playoffs with Minnesota in like my third year pro. So it'd been a long time. And that really kind of ignited that like fire to like play playoff hockey again. It, it was, it was a blast. So I, I had a really good time there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we'll move forward, but even just before I want to mention with the Leafs preseason, I remember I'm a huge Leafs fan. My brother, my family, we're all huge Leafs fans. I remember in the preseason, we're watching the games and we we're just like, who is this Gabriel guy running everybody, pumping a guy every game? Like this guy needs to stick. We were rooting for you like from the start. So it was, it was awesome. I loved your preseason, man. Thank you. It turned into like, you know, people, you know, you play like a cup of coffee in the preseason of the team or play one game, you turn into like, Oh, Curtis Gabriel Leafs legend. Like I had so many tweets about that and stuff. It was just like getting ridiculous. I'm like, all right, people, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, Curtis Gabriel Leafs legend. Anytime anything happens, Curtis Gabriel Leafs legend. Like, all right, I get it. Thank you. It was, it was fun though. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe they'll let you into the alumni lounge. Me and Cards, you got a, an invite into the alumni lounge for a game. We're eating Harvard 60 steaks and stuff in there with the legends. Like, was... listen, man, I got, I, when I signed Colby Armstrong called me and he's like, dude, do whatever you can to play one regular season game. Cause guess what? You get access to that thing the rest of your life, kid. And I'm <laughs> like, I'm like, arm dog, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do everything I can. And I think I did. And uh, I'm proud of how I did, but that you guys getting in there, you've been in there. Not, I'm not ever getting in there. So God, good, good for you guys. That's, that's nice. You yeah. never know. You never know. You could go back to the Leafs at some point once you're, uh, once you're running up and down the, the NHL full time here this year hopefully maybe we'll see yeah maybe maybe cards maybe we'll slide him an invite he can come hang with us in there yeah, we'll, yeah you guys oh, yeah, yeah. You guys get me in to get you some steaks that's how it should work yeah and then he, he can take us to san jose um minnesota uh, Philly, <laughs> uh all the other places that he has access yeah now now moving forward to like a lot of the stuff i want to talk about you got a lot of business things going on a lot of things going on off the ice so i want to start with healthy eats can you tell us about that? Yeah. I mean, I'm a, like a skinnier body type. Like I have to work to be 215. You know, I have to eat. Like I, I was stuffing my face before I came on here. Like it was like the fourth <laughs> time I've eaten today and I'm going to go at 9 PM and stuff my face again before I go to bed. So uh, I've always been into nutrition, cooking myself for so long. This is partly because I know this business is going to kill it. And also I don't want to make my food anymore. So I get my meals for free because I partly own this thing, which is huge, but it's uh elite food guys. Like it's top notch. It's no messing around. The ingredients are like what your mom would make something. It's just simple, healthy to the point, more kind of paleo meals. Uh, it started out of London, Ontario, and we deliver Sunday to Sunday and Wednesday. So you get it twice a week. You can, you know, get single meals or you can get a subscription, but uh, right now we're just out of London and we got the Canada summer games that's going on in Niagara right now. So we got that contract, but never going to open up a location or a ghost kitchen in uh, Burlington, I think, or Hamilton. And then we're going to start serving the GTA probably, you know, start of the winter uh, coming up here. So really excited about that, trying to get as much hype uh, built up for it as we can. 
really trying to, you know, take over Toronto's kind of meal prep business and then see where we can go from there. We want to take it to the, to the top, but it's, I, I'm going to try to get the Leafs facility on it. I got Haley Wickenheiser interested. I'm trying to get everybody I can gyms, um, maybe Matt Nichols gym where I'm at now. I've already pitched that today there on day one. So trying to blow that thing up. So I'm excited uh, for people to try it when it comes out. Yeah, that, that's unreal. Maybe we'll have to work on a little showbound promo code or something yeah, after, but something like that um, for sure. Uh, you also got, we got a lot of fan questions about your advo- advocacy for the LGBTQ plus community. And can you tell us how that started and, and what you're doing now? I know you got some stuff going on. Yes, sir. Uh, so back to uh, Jersey, when I, uh, that summer before going there, I had a friend, uh, an ex, sorry, an ex-girlfriend's friend come out to be in a relationship and she got totally like unsupported by her family like two doctors that were just not supporting her anymore she had to move right in with her girlfriend it just like seeing that firsthand it wasn't like a family member but it was close enough where I was just like I could not imagine my mom not supporting who I wanted to date like that just makes no sense to me so uh, fast forward to the tw- calendar year the next 2019 where I have a pride night with the devils and um, they had pride tape who I work really closely with now uh, was just you know, passing out the tape and said hey guys put it on the blade you're sick for warm up you don't have to wear it in the game and i I was dialed in. I'd scored my first goal two nights ago. I was playing Montreal. I'm like, I got to focus here. I'm not changing the blade tape right now. I got black tape. I'm not putting that down there. So I put it on the shaft of my stick, uh, just below my grip kind of tape. And I remember coming after warm up and being like, everybody's taking it off. And I looked at mine. It was like a split second decision of like, it would take more time for me to tape tighter that off than to just leave it on. And maybe somebody will notice. And then I was back to focusing on the game. And uh, just so happened uh, that the game was televised in Canada was kind of nationally televised and to score the game winning goal with the tape on my stick. It kind of just was meant to be, it seems. And that seems how a lot of my life has gone. Just kind of follow my heart with things. So it got human humanized to me. And I realized that I could make a difference. Um, and uh, I had a lot of people reach out after that. Brock McGillis, who's the first openly gay former professional hockey player to come out. He's my good friend now. And he kind of called me and was like, or, you know, are you really going to work in this space? And I was kind of like, uncomfortable I never talked to such like a confident like out gay guy and it took me kind of a year to kind of get used to everything I didn't grow up with this like you guys all grow up with this now uh the youth I think are really going to change this kind of this uh issue but yeah I've been working on it ever since and work for some charities there's one that'll Toronto get real movement there's another one called Rainbow Railroad they help people get out of like Afghanistan who are going to get murdered because of their sexuality it's unbelievable so it's, it's really important work, I think. And I think all of us, you know, you guys are putting in time here and in separate parts of your lives grinding. I think all of us can kind of step outside of our normal lives and give back. And I, I think it not only helps everyone, it helps yourself too. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. very, very well said. That's amazing to hear about uh, what you got going on outside the game and so much great initiatives. So we're really happy to see that. And we're really happy to support anything you're doing like that. So with that being said, let's roll into the this or that. We kind of got a few fan questions in here, and then the, the fans love to hear about this stuff. So uh, I'll give you two options. You give me one of them. Uh, bar down or five hole? Whew. I've, I scored my first intentional five hole goal this year, I swear, because that's just not like a skill I built in. So I'm going to go five hole. I'm going that way now. Okay, I love it. Shoot first or pass first? I've always been pass first, but I got to shoot more. Okay. Cardio or weights? Uh, yeah weights all day for sure ice cream or milkshake oh ice cream for sure I, yeah i gotta go ice cream up chocolate or candy oh wow chocolate night in or night out younger me a night out now night in grandpa yep <laughs> you're getting old uh crosby or ovechkin crosby all day yeah. all right that's, that, that's it for the uh this or that Okay, so now I got a game for you, and we we debuted this game last week, and and it was a hit. So basically, it's called Sign Trade Release. It's like a spinoff of F Mary Kill. So I'll name three players, and basically you you got to pick. Okay, so the first one, bringing it back to the Leafs, Sign Trade Release: Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, John Tavares. Thanks for the you know weekend at the cottage there, JT. But you're getting released, and. <laughs> Sign in a math long term and Mitch has got to go. All right. I like the decisiveness there. Um, okay. Bringing it to Chicago. We got Patty Kane, Jonathan Taze, and Alex to bring it. Who? Wow. Uh, I'd say you got a, I would have signed to bring it. I would have traded Kaner and released Taser. Oh, that's such a tough call, but yeah. Um, I mean, hey, they don't give a crap what I say. So that's why it's good to say it. 
<laughs> um, yeah, imagine, imagine what they'd be saying about you. I'd love it. I don't think they waste any time on me. Oh, Gaber of the Showbound podcast is released. Yeah, they don't care. <laughs> um, okay, so how about San Jose? We got Logan Couture, Thomas Hurdle, Timo Meyer. Wow. Those are those are some good good dudes right there, too. Um I think uh you gotta release Coots now. You gotta sign Hurdle and you gotta trade Meyer for some assets. Okay. And then last one, Wayne Gretzky, Bobby Orr, Gordy Howe. <laughs> okay. Oh man. <laughs> You know what? I love the stories of Gordy Howe, but he only fought like 20 times. So I, I don't, I don't literally buy all that. So we're releasing Gordy. Um, uh, apparently Bobby was just next level. So I'm going to say, let's say sign Bobby and trade Gretzky. Gretzky. Okay. That, that's the game. Very well done. And uh, I, like I said, I like the decisiveness. Those are good ones. I, I took a ride up to Muskoka with Spezza there and back. Let me tell you, I was picking that guy's brain about hockey. So I'm trying to like be decided. This guy's just going to be decisive. You see that clip of him the other day taking notes and yeah, stuff, yeah. Like his cheat sheet, and everybody else is just watching. Dude, that guy's going to be next level. So trying to be decisive like Spets here. Okay, so we know Gaber's next job after hockey is special assistant to the GM then, just like oh. Spets. That's He's a special thing. assistant to Spezza. Yeah. Well, yeah, that'd be interesting. I don't know. I'd have to keep it in my lane, but man, the politics of hockey can get crazy. So I don't know. I think I, I, Spets is going, you know, he's going that, that way because he's going after that cup still. I think I'd be player side only development. Don't give me any of that. Don't give me any of those politics. Don't give me nothing. I just want to love the game. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's go into the fan questions now. Our favorite part. So, we got a bunch of fan questions, actually. Big episodes. The fans come out calling. So uh, tell us about your hallway fight versus Vince oh, Dunn. Mm, I don't think I've – I don't know. I think I've told this before on a podcast. But here, it's good. It's always good to clear the air on this stuff. So um, what happened was uh, we were down like maybe 3 or 4-1, um, get the graveyard fourth line shift, right? I hadn't played in my like eight minutes trying to get the goal back. So I come out fired up i'm not happy i don't like a graveyard shift but hey i'll go make the most of it so i went and ran around buried a couple people hit vince a little harder than he would have liked and he uh, like two-handed me so i kind of like everybody thinks i hit him in the face but i didn't i like pushed him with my glove in the throat like a nice little throat shot and then he threw his gloves down and i said perfect and i started going at him but then james wisniewski his veteran d partner came and jumped on my right arm and then the whole team jumped on me. I end up on my back looking straight up and Dunner is just pounding me into the ice where I can't defend myself. Yeah. Um, I get up incensed, but then we calm down. But of course this happens. The only place you walk out the same place that the other team, I go back in my room. I hear him chirping me from the hallway. I have my little wires cross. And then as I'm stepping on the concrete with my blades, I kind of have that moment of like, my mom's a teacher. I never got in trouble. I'm going to get assault. I'm going to get charged with assault if I football tackle him and beat him into the ground right now. So I kind of wake up and I just decided to grab him and kind of shake him and be like, I'm going to get you next game. I can't remember what I said. And then full credit to him. He took the chance to throw a bomb because I kind of went over to him and he caught me with it. I got a six game suspension. He got nothing. Um, I wouldn't have got that many if it didn't go viral on the internet. I still get tagged in that thing. You know, stuff happens, man. But I'm just really happy I didn't do any. I could have done bad things, and I'm glad I didn't. So I'm happy with how it played out. Okay, good. Good to hear. Uh, <laughs> thank. Thankfully, you didn't get more for that because it was blown up like way bigger than it should have. I know. But uh, no, that's good. And favorite road city in the AHL and the NHL. It could be the same city if it's duplicates. Yeah. 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 Um, surprisingly, I had a lot of good times in Cleveland playing the monsters. I don't know why, but there was just a good little bar uh, street there. And then there's this unreal taco place. It's called Barrio. We'd always go destroy tacos there. So good AHL place undercover, uh, up top. I mean, Vegas is just, I had never really been there. So that was, that was pretty cool to be able to go there. And, um, yeah, I, I playing there is nuts. And then off ice is like, to, you know, you can't talk about it, you know? Yeah, it's obviously pretty electric in Vegas. And uh, now a big one that I'm kind of interested to hear, too. Who's the toughest guy you've fought? Uh, hands down, the toughest guy. It wasn't necessarily the toughest fight I had because it just I was being very careful. But Brett Gallant is the toughest guy, in my opinion, maybe of all time. Um, he's six foot, 200 pounds. He will. He's cold cocked, six foot five, 250 pound guys. He's 
He's not afraid to take a punch. And I, I think there's two different types of fighter. There's a tough fighter. And then there's a guy who's just a good fighter. He's not necessarily tough. He's both. And it's absolutely terrifying. Yeah. So did you win or lose? Oh, no, I mean, the first one, I was young and I was sure to show I could fight everybody. So I kept him at a good distance. I didn't let him do too much damage. I snuck a couple in and then I think he kind of took me down. And then the next time, uh, I think one of his teammates knew that he was standing right beside me. So he two-handed me and got me mad and I two-handed him back and I knew Galley was coming right behind me. So I just shut him quick and it was like a quicker one because you do not, you just got to be careful with a guy like that. He's a different kind of breed, man. Different breed. Yeah, keep your head up when he's on the ice. Good advice for the young uh, crop. Um, but uh, growing up, did you always know you were going to make the NHL like deep down? Or did I guess you said you kind of gave up on it, right? It's, it just wasn't even an option. Like it just yeah. what like I played every sport at a high level. I loved hockey the most, but it just wasn't even a thing. I think I've always had I think any athlete that plays at a high level had like an inner drive and confidence, but I think when, once I went to that junior A tryout, when I didn't even like my mom was just like, your other teammates are going, you might as well go. It's 50 bucks. I'm like, okay, mom, I'll go. And when I went there and I played well, that kind of like, I was like, man, like maybe I could like do this. Like, I didn't think I was actually good. Nobody's told me I'm good. So I think from then on, I was like, screw it. Let's just see what happens. But I never really thought at all. I never watched the end challenge. Like I'm going to play that. Yeah. And you've had a lot of like good words of wisdom and like great stuff that we've heard today. And like, everybody's going to really enjoy. And I think this is kind of the perfect question to leave off on um, because I think you'll address this perfectly, but what advice do you have for young hockey players struggling with confidence? Oh man. Hockey is just one aspect of life. I know it's the best game in the world and we all love it. And some, for some people it's our lives, but I would highly encourage a young kid. I was that kid. Like my dad took his own life when I was 10 years old. So my mom took me out of AAA the first year I played AAA in Richmond Hill at 10 years old, took me back to single A, double A, and I just played hockey for fun because that's what I needed. So go play and find that love of the game again. Cause if you're not going to have that, you're not going to go anywhere. You know, there's very rare athletes. Andre Agassi made it to the top and he hated tennis. Just his dad made him play it. That's so rare. You don't want to be that guy. Anyway, go play where you have fun. If you end up not making that hockey, great. Go do something else with your life. Go, just go have fun and uh, see where it takes you. And then if you get a little older, you want to take it more serious. Sure. But just have fun. Yeah, I hit the nail on the head with that one. And I think that pretty much sums it up from us. And we really appreciate you taking the time tonight to do this. And it was an amazing interview from, from my point of view. I'm no Rask is going to say the same thing, but I just want to say thank you. Thanks very much, Cards. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. And I mean, Cards said it all, but it was a great interview. I'm excited for this one to get out to the, to the listeners. And yeah, we really appreciate having you on. It was good to finally get this one done. And I'm excited to follow along the rest of your career here. Thank you, boys. Yeah, I'll be watching you guys, too. And kids can take a lot from you guys doing something outside of your normal, you know, nine to five playing hockey or working with the you know, ice dogs and stuff like go find your passion and do other things. Life's too short time to do the, like these extra things. So you guys are great role, role models and I appreciate the time. Yeah. And just one more thing before we wrap it up, Gaber, just give me a break if I'm playing against you here in the next few years. Just uh, yeah. give, I don't, don't want to be the guy getting blown up out there. <laughs> don't, step, don't go over the red line and you'll be safe and warm up. And then in the game, I can't guarantee anything. So just keep your head up. Let's... Okay. I'll keep my head up when two nines out there. <laughs> Just want to thank Gaber for that one. And we were just saying, like, we just went off the air and we we're like, that was a really good interview. So I'm really happy about the way that turned out, Rask. Yeah, it was, it was awesome, man. And he speaks with so much passion and, and wisdom too, you know, for a guy who's been through it. And you know what, it actually, we always have this, like, and we have a lot of good top prospects and we have this notion of like, you're going to go make the NHL, maybe a couple years in the minors and you're going to play and you're going to stick and dude, people get sent down, but we don't really talk about that stuff because we have a lot of higher end prospects, I guess. And you don't think about that stuff, but it's something to be aware of because it'll affect one, like your mindset Two, maybe your love of the game or three, how hard you're working. But he, you know, shows the story of persistence and, you know, he's on the cusp of sticking every year for so long. So it was just interesting hearing it uh, come out of his mouth. And like he said, he's a Toronto Maple Leafs legend forever. So exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome having him on. Always oh, a leaf legend. And yeah, like you said, you can kind of just hear it in the way he speaks. Like he's just so excited about the game just so excited to be able to give it, be given the opportunity to be a hockey player. And that's kind of what we're preaching here. Like we just want to spread like good vibes in the hockey world and stuff like that. So I think that was a great interview. And I think a lot of people are really going to enjoy that one. Yeah. Now, I mean, not too much else going on. Uh, 
just gonna, you know, get ready for the big tennis day tomorrow. And it, it's actually a cooler day. It's a perfect day to be outside all day. So I'm, I'm pumped for that. And, uh, but that's pretty much all I have. Do you want to, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, obviously you just gave me the weather report for tomorrow. So with that being said, go enjoy your tennis and uh, we'll get back to you guys next week with another banger. For you.